so with our extra time, we thought it would, was important for you all to know who NDIA is and what we do. We have a lot of new folks joining us this year. <clears throat> we are always conscious that we don't anybody ever get bored. <laughs> so we really like lightning rounds. So that's our plan. This is another lightning round. We have a bunch of affiliates who are going to tell you the incredible ways that they have been engaging with NDIA because the message and the, the way that we work is that we are a community. Right, so everything we do is based upon what we learn from you, what your needs are, um, what your ex expertise is, and it, it impacts everything we do. And you will see that with our folks here. This is not very easy to read. Uh, Andrew, can you bump it up some more? So this is the NDIA purpose. All the slides that are going to be up here when folks are coming up are, the, are from the NDIA website. So everything that's posted, you'll be able to find on digitalinclusion.org. This is our purpose. There are four, item, four items here, but really you can divide into two buckets. And those two buckets are peer-to-peer -peer network, supporting each other, and, and teaching each other, and you know, it is that, it is us being together. The other piece of it is policy and advocacy. So anything that we do around policy and advocacy is based upon us being a community. Right? So everything in that policy advocacy field, national, local, state, comes from what we learned from you all. So I'm going to hand it over to our first, Clayton Banks, and they're going to, they each have four minutes. Right? You can time them if you want. All right, I like that hot dog you guys served. That was pretty good. Um, so I'm Clayton Banks from Silicon Harlem. I'm going to do this a little different, Angela. I'm actually going to give you guys my top 10 reasons to be an NDIA member. So number 10, as an NDIA member, it's a great investment. I will talk more about that in a moment. But your investment in NDIA will grow. Number nine, NDIA is all about results. In fact, our first win, I believe, was the lifeline broadband policy. So we actually uh, are winners. We are winning. Number, uh, what number am I on? Number eight. This is a bridge to policymakers. And heck, who wouldn't want to rub shoulders with Ajit Pai and Donald Trump? So, number seven, we're going to go down in history as closing all gaps, closing all divides. Some of you will actually have a statue somewhere, so we can't wait for that. Number six. The NDIA Net Inclusion Summits always tend to take place where there are great mayors. Is the mayor still here? <laughs> oh, man, I was hoping to get an escort back to the airport. All right. Um, number five, and this is a good one. As a goal, NDI, as a goal, a written goal, you can see it on the website, it supports the development of research. You're going to hear more about that in just a moment. You get access and exposure to those riveting webinars. Thank you, Angela, for those. Uh, I think I'm on number three. Rumor has it that the 2019 net inclusion will be accepting cryptocurrency for your registration. That's awesome. And number two. As I mentioned, personally, Silicon Harlem has benefited from the work of NDIA in the form of $25 million that we've been able to pull into Upper Manhattan because of the lobbying that NDIA has done with the NSF. Most of the funding that we are receiving is directly from the NSF, directly for broadband research, which was directly lobbied by NDIA. And my final and number one reason to join NDIA is, of course, that listserv has superpowers. <laughs> the information shared, you know, we all use it in our presentations. We are using it to make ourselves look smart in our communities. And we, 
we are all together fighting and working hard in our own various ways of expertise to make sure we're building a greater country. Thank you, NDIA. Thank you, Clayton, for making that impossible to follow. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tianka Crocker, and I'm a fellow with NDIA, and will soon join the faculty at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, I wanted to <laughs> go 49ers. Oh, OK. Um, so I wanted to talk about the work we've been doing the, over the last six months with digital inclusion coalitions. As you all may know, as the affiliates are doing a lot of the hard work in local communities and are the expertise on a lot of the issues regarding digital inclusion. So over the last six months, we've talked to coalitions from across the country. We talked to DEN, the Digital Inclusion Network in Portland, the Charlotte Digital Inclusion Alliance, the San Antonio Digital Inclusion Alliance, and I may have uh, mix the wording up on that one. But we talked to a lot of great folks who are doing the local work, who found a reason to say, hey, we want a collective strategy to achieve the goals um, for digital inclusion in our community. So we've created a guidebook. If you go to the NDIA website, um, digitalinclusion.org, and you check the banner, you'll see a link for a guidebook. I encourage you to go there to click on that to learn more about what we found working with coalitions that are doing a lot of this work, uh, aligning programming, developing local strategies, um, advocating, educating policymakers. So I encourage you to check that out. And also there is a session on digital inclusion coalitions tomorrow at 1 p.m. And I encourage you to go there and meet with the other affiliates who are doing this work locally. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Dave Keyes. I'm the digital equity manager at the city of Seattle. And um, first, a big shout out for all of you for making the effort to come here. As somebody said uh, to me earlier today, it's awesome to be here and find out we're not alone. So, and, and I'm an expert because I get access to all of you experts. And I think that's what um, led to some of the forming and the organization of the National Digital Inclusion. And, and again, big kudos to, uh, to Angela for all her organizing work. So I just want to take a moment to do that. So I'm just going to talk about this definitions of digital equity and digital inclusion because one of the things that we were finding is, so I work in digital inclusion. What the heck is that? Um, and we kept hearing that from a lot of different folks, from people in the field saying, I'm doing this and how do I frame it? How do I talk about it to my mayor, my council people, or my, my potential collaborators? And then we heard it from national things. So um, we're looking at who's at the table when policy decisions are being made federally or by companies around digital inclusion. Well, what is that? And so um, a group of us started collaborating to take what had been a number of different definitions, different scopes, and uh, to weave that in to say, let's have a national definition for digital inclusion and digital equity. So this came about because people who were affiliated with NDIA and willing to put in some time um, started just hammering together some of what we were seeing around these. And to say, yeah, there's, uh, again, digital inclusion is those activities, digital equity is this condition um, of equity, and it's really necessary for those outcomes that we want. And so we took that, we started working with it, massaging it, and, and using the network of NDIA, we then sent it out for people to comment on and contribute to. So because of that, and because of all of you, contributing to this, we now have something, um, and all of you have something, and legislators have something, and companies have something, and community groups and folks have something to point to to say, here is our definitions of digital equity and digital inclusion. Take it, you know, it's real, let's move forward. So thanks to all of you, thanks to NDIA, that's part of what being part of NDIA leads to. I'm so glad I can see over the podium. I'm Sandy Tharp. I'm from Oklahoma. I uh, am one of five. We just finished a special project with NDIA that was funded by IMLS, a Digital Inclusion Corps uh, member. 
we had five states involved, Alaska, Arizona, uh, Minnesota, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. It was to serve underserved communities, uh, rural communities, and native tribes. The, the best way to hear the stories that came from that, because it became a collection of many stories and many people that were touched, is to look at uh, the website at uh, digitalinclusion.org and read our blogs that we wrote weekly. We, our host organizations helped us in many ways. We learned from them. We also learned we had volunteers from the NDI community that also listened in on our phone calls and our um, uh, tomorrow, Thursday from 1 to 2, Nicole, she's from Arizona, will be talking more about our stories. I also wanted to say thank you to one of the community partners that is here with me today that continues to work on the project with me, and that is uh, Sonia Wall from OneNet, and she's here. So um, there's many people that work together to make this project, and it was life-changing. I um, can't even begin to say we helped uh, libraries that did not have internet. We created uh, libraries uh, that had no, had not had any connections for over 10 years. We developed um, places where seniors could come and just be connected. So. Thank you for everybody's support in making this project available. Hi, uh, I'm Amina Fazula, and I'm currently a Tech Policy Fellow with Mozilla and um, also serve on NDIA's board. and. Um, and serve as a, a policy advisor to NDIA as well. And um, my experience with NDIA, just to give you my sort of like personal moment where I decided NDIA was something so important that I really needed to engage and invest in, in Angela and the work that her and Bill have been doing. It was a few years ago, and we were at a coalition meeting on Lifeline, um, which I'll explain to you in a moment what that is. and. Um, and we realized that Angela was bringing a unique voice to the table in DC that no one else at the coalition meeting could bring. There are a lot of policy wonks in the room, but Angela was representing the people on the ground in the states, in the local communities that were actually doing digital inclusion work and actually understood what it took. And that story and that voice was so critical that me and another colleague literally opened up our checkbooks right then and there and made sure that she could change her flight and continue to stay in DC at least one more day so that she could go to our meetings. Um, that's how important Angela and NDIA are, and especially to the work in DC. Um, and with that, um, to explain what Lifeline is, it's one of the projects that uh, NDA has taken on. Um, the Lifeline program is a, a federal program under the Universal Service uh, Fund, uh, which the FCC is in charge of, that provides uh, a monetary support to low-income individuals to have access to telecommunications. Um, Angela and NDIA was a critical member of the team ensuring that the FCC, when they updated and modernized their rules during the Obama administration, included broadband in a much more robust way. And not only did they encourage the, um, the changeover from Lifeline being focused on voice service to broadband, but also she worked to make sure that digital inclusion practitioners and partners on the ground could potentially participate in the Lifeline program as providers, creating a whole new innovative um, group of potential providers for low-income consumers. Because um, there are a lot of us who are here who understand that sometimes the 
the typical broadband provider isn't going to be the low cost option um, or is it the option that your clients are currently using? Um, and wouldn't it be great if the Lifeline program, which provides this 925 subsidy, would be able to be used by digital inclusion practitioners that were developing their own access programs? So Angela spearheaded that and actually won and got the inclusion of the Lifeline broadband provider designation, which was um, a piece of the Lifeline program that was opening up to um, digital inclusion practitioners and non-traditional providers, um, like some of those in the room today. Um, <clears throat> since then, uh, the Lifeline program has experienced uh, a number of attacks. And um, again, NDIA has been critical in making sure that they can protect and preserve that program. And what's interesting is that not only is Angela coming to DC to advocate for Lifeline and other federal projects, <clears throat> but Angela has also been able to bring members of NDIA and bring not just their stories, but the actual members to the table to make sure that they're heard at the FCC, <clears throat> in the White House, and also on the Hill. It's been so exciting to join Angela and her team at NDIA and watch all of the digital inclusion practitioners tell their stories to policymakers and watch policymakers start to understand what digital ac inclusion actually is and what it means to their constituents, what it means to their communities, and actually literally watch them start to change their minds or open their minds to what would be needed to support digital inclusion. So um, I really encourage you all to support NDIA, join NDIA, and hopefully I'll see you soon in DC alongside Angela as she continues her important work. Thank you. Of, of broadband speeds, um, do, what broadband speeds does one need to currently operate IoT technologies, do you think? So it's, that's a hugely, the answer varies massively by the technology and by the individuals using the technology. So if you, as mentioned earlier, as video becomes more common within the health industry and we are then wanting that patient in their home to use that video with their health providers, 10-1 is insufficient, right? But we're not at a point where everybody needs video currently, but we all should be making decisions about what our situation is now. We as a country need to be planning for the future. Uh, does anyone else want to engage in, in that issue? About what, uh, what speeds are adequate now in, in terms of operating IoT technologies? No volunteers? One other thing then, um, Ms. Seifer, you say we don't currently have a program to address cost. Uh, what do you advocate? So we don't currently have data that tells us what it costs for someone to have broadband in their home. If you even deal with quick online search, what you'll be able to find is an introductory price from a provider at that particular address, and you might be able to find what their regular cost is. And sometimes if you call the provider, they'll tell you what the regular cost is, but they don't always. And you can't go online right now and find a map that tells us it's more expensive here, it's least expensive here, these are the different price points. So that is something that would need to be legislated. That is not, the FCC is never going to tell the providers do they have the authority? They have the authority, but I don't know that they have the political interest. So administration in and administration out. 
Democrat, Republican. No, none of uh, them. They, they have mm. not done so. So you no. would advocate legislation? Uh, it would have to be legislation. Anyone wish to take issue with that? <laughs> well, uh, That was awesome. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I'm Shauna Edson. I'm the digital inclusion um, coordinator for the Salt Lake City Public Library in Salt Lake City. I'm also um, the lead um, for the planning committee for uh, digital inclusion week, um, which is May 7th through 11th of this year. Um, I got interested in Digital Inclusion Week, what, kind of watching events unfold last year. A lot of really great things happened all over the country. Um, my interest peaked when um, Library Journal wrote an article on the great program that San Francisco Public Library did. Uh, my executive director folded over a corner and set that article on my desk, so I took that as a hint, and um, here I am. Uh, work, working on it this year. Uh, my favorite thing about Digital Inclusion Week is it, bring, it brings NDIA affiliates together um, and gives a, a platform to share our work, um, raise awareness of digital inclusion, um, and build community. So it's pretty great to be able to share the stories of all of the work that we're doing um, on a platform together um, and, and ways that we do internally in conferences like this and through our lists, uh, listservs, but to also share that work publicly. Um, so the planning committee is 14 affiliates. It's decision, decisions made and driven by affiliates of NDIA. You are all part of that. We welcome you to be part of that. Um, please like, don't hesitate to ask questions or make comments. Um, or we welcome all participation. Um, so ways that you can get involved. Uh, create or find an event in your area. Events can be a digital resource fair, door-to-door uh, -door outreach, device uh, donation drive, one-day workshops, resume rallies, uh, open, house, um, open houses to invite community members in to talk about digital inclusion, um, an internet enrollment event. Um, another way that you can participate is connect with colleagues to share ideas through our mailing list. Um, and this year we're hoping for a large social media campaign uh, using hashtags. So we have three hashtags. The first one is digital inclusion. And the second is digital DIW 2018. Um, and the third is digital equity is, um, and a blank. And we're hoping that, um, that affiliates take a chance to really help us define and understand um, what digital equity means on a macro level uh, across NDIA, and also on our micro level for our, our small communities. Um, you can also, outside by the registration desk, there's post-it notes uh, with the hashtag, and we invite you to fill those in and stick them up on the board, and we'll get that conversation going um, earlier. Um, one way that uh, the city library is participating in this is we're doing a social media campaign based on that hashtag where every day during the week we're posting um, an, Im an image of an individual using um, participating in digital inclusion programming within the library, um, and then we're, sh we're having a quote uh, from that person uh, using those hashtags. So that's just one way that your organization can part participate without too high um, of a planning level. Um, so please, also on the, on the website, um, you can register as a host. It's not required, but we ask that you please do register. We'd like to know how many um, organizations are planning um, Digital Inclusion Week programs. Um, and then uh, we'll also add you to a mailing list, and we will publish that as well so you can be recognized. Um, and also on the website, you can find information on um, a press kit, our logos, and then some really pre-written pre tweets that you could just click on, and it will tweet for you. Um, so I invite you to participate, and please ask me any questions um, and get involved. Hi, um, I'm Bill Callahan, and um, as my profile uh, on the website says, I have two hats on. Um, the hat that most people know me with is my uh, work with the NDIA, but I'm also the director of an organization called Connect Your Community here in Cleveland. And in that role, I want to say, welcome to Cleveland. 
<laughs> and um, I'm not going to say anything about the weather. Um, uh, actually, could everybody from Cleveland in the room put your hand up? Right? Uh, there's a lot of people who can tell you a lot about the city. Um, please take advantage of them. Um, we have a, uh, actually a great group and, um, and a, great, a lot of really interesting and diverse stuff going on in the city now. Um, I was asked to talk about something which is, for many people, uh, may have been the first time you read about NDIA in the national media. Uh, it certainly is the thing that's gotten us the most hits. Um, and that's a report that we released a um, year and a half ago now, uh, or actually a little over a year ago, on the subject of digital redlining. I don't want to go into the details of the report here because it's online and because you'll hear a little bit about it in the plenary today and because we have a workshop this afternoon uh, about digital justice where we'll talk about it. So I don't want to spend time talking about it. Um, but let me tell you the story of how it came to be because it has, it's an interesting model for the way that NDIA and a local community uh, collaborate to amplify something. So um, this whole thing began because two years ago uh, a bunch of us got together in Cleveland to talk about how we could promote the AT&T Access Program, which is AT&T's discount program happened through a, de a merger deal at the FCC Thank you, Megan Clyburn. Um, and uh, what it said was people on uh, SNAP, food assistance, could get um, internet service at speeds from 5 to 10 megs um, at prices from 5 to $10, right? Or 3 to 10 megs, 5 to $10. Basically, that's 200,000 households in Cuyahoga County, right? It's huge, right? So um, we uh, put a meeting together. We started working as a coalition to, to try to develop a program to promote this. And we did a, a kind of um, test run over the summer of 2016. And um, what happened quickly was that people started getting phone calls from people saying, I tried to apply and they wouldn't let me on. And so after the 15th of those, uh, we started trying to figure out what was in fact going on. And the answer was that those people didn't have three meg service. They were neighborhoods which had AT&T DSL service and it didn't equal three megs. It was 768, it was 1.5, it was zero, right? This was a huge surprise to me as a local activist because we've had AT&T DSL in this city since 2001, right? So the idea that you couldn't get three megs every place in the city, I was floored. So after, you know, we were trying to figure out, so how do we know where we can tell people they can apply, right? Because we certainly didn't want to be telling people go get this and then have them blame us, right? And the answer was the only way we could do it was to um, take the federal 477 data, which is the you know, one source of data about speeds around the country. Um, and so we did that, right? And uh, we did a map, and the map was a map of census blocks. If people have any familiarity with the data, if not, won't try to explain it here, but it's, it's public data. Massive CSV files. And, uh, but we downloaded it, we worked it, we made a map of the city, and what we discovered uh, was that there were all these places where you couldn't get um, uh, speeds above a meg and a half, and they had a familiar pattern, right? Here's a little hot spot, here's a circle around it. You get out a mile and a half in the circle and the speed is down to a meg and a half, right? And okay, that's DSL, right? We know that, that's how that works. It's the copper running out from the central office, but we thought we were supposed to have fiber into those neighborhoods with a box on the, what we call a tree lawn here, right? And copper out from that and we would have speeds. It's our equivalent, right? It's called uh, fiber to the node. That got us started looking into this. And so long story short, the study that we ended up doing uh, over the next six months was trying to figure out exactly what had happened, right? And we concluded at the end of it that over the course of eight years of constructing their what is now standard delivery system for broadband and cable, right? AT&T had simply not deployed their system around four inner city central offices. Now, I come from housing organizing way back and I recognize what that is. That's called redlining, 
right? <laughs> That's a, de a decision not to deploy infrastructure to serve people in an area because of the characteristics of the area. In this case, we doubt, even though this very, very, very heavily impacted low income and African American neighborhoods, which are not, of course, the same thing, right? <laughs> Nonetheless, the real pattern was it was about income, right? It was clearly about, about low income poverty. So we mapped all this, right? So our question was, what are we going to do with this? Now, let me just say, this is not something that most of the people we work with really wanted to be associated with putting in the newspaper. And just be clear about that, right? This is edgy stuff, right? You're not supposed to blame your local provider for doing something bad, right? Let alone illegal, right? And it is, right? <laughs> so, so we figured out, we worked on this, we figured out some organizational approaches, we did the research and all that stuff, and finally, um, after a little bit of working, and, and there was another episode here which I left out where, where Angela actually intervened with AT&T and got them to lower the threshold for the program, but the point was that still left us with a city with no service in, in a lot of neighborhoods. Um, so we ended up, uh, NDIA ended up, after looking around for other potential partners, uh, releasing, co-releasing this report with the local organization, which is CYC. Now, what is this a model for? One, it's a model for being serious about looking at the underlying problems you're dealing with when you're confronting things like, we can't get service in this neighborhood. It's also a model for not being afraid of the data that's there. And one of the things that we can do in our national network now is help people figure out how to use the data. And we have a lot of workshops in this conference about that. Um, and we do. And the third thing um, is that uh, the national and local organizations, where it makes sense, can be very effective partners in taking that information and getting it out into the larger world, which we were very successful with with that report. So I really want to recommend that anybody in any community where you're confronting not just that situation, that's a particular AT&T historical thing, right? But that kind of problem, give Angela or me a call because it's one of the things we do. <laughs> And I am last. So, I will be short. I will tell a couple stories and then I'll let you know what I do. I met Angela online through Twitter or somehow. She never responded to me in time. She would not follow me back, Twitter. So I was just heartbroken. After about a couple months, maybe years, I did some extension work. I still work for extension down in Mississippi. And we were piloting a, a telework program called Digital Works down there. And I had recruited a couple of participants. They went through the program. They got trained. She was an older lady that had been unemployed for at least 10 years. She was excited about this. And we went through the training. Everything was great. I asked her before she signed up, do you have internet at home? She said, I do. Long story short, she graduates. She gets a job interview with a company. Uh, she is about to get the job offered when they run a speed test. And her speed didn't make the three meg threshold, so she was not offered the job. So then again, I go back to Angela. Now this time, thank goodness, she, you know, we start uh, communicating more. So that's when I was really, really thankful for this organization, for all of us that are in the trenches. And we see this happen constantly, I was so excited that we have this national thing going on. So with that story, uh, I am a number cruncher, but I also like to be out in the field. Uh, I do research and extension currently at Purdue. And we wrote a recent article where we, with other colleagues, because it's all about collaboration. So Brian Whitaker from Oklahoma State, I've done some work with Sharon, uh, myself, and others. We crunched the numbers on the very user-friendly FCC Form 477. And we found very interesting stuff, so we put it out there. Again, as a team, we have this massive amount of data. How do you take that and elevate it to where it is useful and meaningful? That's a really big challenge for us number crunchers. But that's where this collaboration comes into a great place. So 
I'm not going to extend any longer, but uh, thank you so much for being here, and I'm delighted to be on the board. And we are back for round two of four for the lightning rounds. Um, can I please get uh, Madeline Tate, Kelsey Webb, Christina Graham, and Elizabeth Lindsay to um, join me up here at this table so we can um, move along lickety split. Um, today our four presenters will be talking about access and adoption and how those two elements are necessarily coinciding to be able to provide some of the great resources that we have. Um, while we are making our way up to the front, I will share some good news. We have a clicker this time, um, thanks to one of our, our generous audience members. So that should, that should be great. Um, same, same drill, we'll have four minutes each. Um, once that time has elapsed, you might see um, 